Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending and also thanks to the organizers for inviting me to have this talk today. I will talk to you about point of care immunoassays and particularly uh, the development of platforms for point of care uh, immunoassay systems and some of the specific challenges that you encounter when developing such a platform. The presentation that I've outlined for you today uh, has two major parts. First, I will uh, highlight some of the challenges that you get when uh, developing such a system. And in the second part of the presentation, I will go in a bit more detail of the, the Minicare system that we developed at Philips uh, and explain how we try to meet these challenges in the way we designed the system. And I will wrap up the presentation with a short uh, summary and conclusion. Uh, if we start uh, looking at the development of a new point of care system, or I would almost say as the development of any new product, it really starts with the end user requirements. So we spent quite some time interviewing the different stakeholders about what are the most important needs when looking at a new point of care a diagnostics platform. And the, the number one requirement that came out was the, the quality of the analytical results. I mean, the results should be comparable to the central lab, and it sounds quite, uh, quite trivial, but if you look at the current status of point of care systems today, that uh, in terms of sensitivity, they're getting quite close, but if you look at precision, there's quite a big gap when you compare the point of care systems with the central lab. The second uh, element that came up quite, uh, quite frequently in these interviews was ease of use. These tests are typically performed by a non-expert operator. We're not working in the lab like in the previous uh, presentation, but it's typically the nurse at the bedside who's performing the test, so that means the test should be very easy to do, no sample handling and very little chance of making any errors. The third element that was also mentioned quite a lot was uh, that there's a need for a point of care system that supports a wide range of tests. Because if you compare the point of care systems with the central lab devices, you can directly see that the menu that's offered on these devices is much smaller. And what that means is that if you want to do a lot of your tests uh, at a, on a point of care system, that you need to manage multiple devices that you all need to maintain, you need to calibrate those, and you need to train all the nurses to work on these systems. So ideally, you would like to have a system that can address a broad range of parameters. They also like to take the system to the patient, so it doesn't necessarily need to be handheld, but uh, portability is, is, is a preference. And as you perform the test near the patient, and both the patient and the physician are waiting for the result, so it should also be a rather fast test. And what we found as a typical cutoff uh, would be a turnaround time of less than 10 minutes. If it takes more than 10 minutes, the physician is not going to wait next to the patient, but moves on to, to do other things and will return only later. Um, another thing that uh, is also quite important is the, the IT, the connectivity part. So if you run a test and if it's not integrated, then the results do not show up in the patient file or in the LIS, HIS. And yeah, of course, it's quite important for, for clinical follow-up to know what the previous values are, but also for the administrative tasks. So it's very important that when you perform point of care tests, that also the IT integration is, is seamless. And finally, sample flexibility. Uh, if you take a test, you may encounter different type of samples. It could be a, a venous sample, it could be a capillary sample, sometimes a serum or plasma is available. And ideally, you would like to have a system that gives consistent results irrespective of the different sample types that are employed. So this is the kind of list of user needs that we uh, gathered and, and, and turned into requirements when we were developing the system. And as you can see, this is already quite a, a challenging list. A second aspect uh, of uh, making a point of care system is that it typically tends to be a much smaller system. And a, a rather straightforward approach to develop a point of care system would be to take a big lab system make everything a bit smaller, and you end up with a small portable device that you can run next to the patient. Unfortunately, uh, it, it's not that easy, and one of the main challenges that I picked out is the, the fluidics aspects of these. As you scale down the system and the, the fluidics volumes, you see that different physical effects start to dominate their system and start to affect the test results. And some of the challenges that you see when you make everything much smaller and working in the microfluidics domain is, for example, dead volume. That volume in a pipe that doesn't play so much of a role when you're working with milliliters of samples. But in our system, the reaction volume is a quarter of a microliter, so a very small dead volume can have a very big impact on the accuracy of your test. 
Also the fluidic interfacing in the big lag systems, you have the automated pipetting robots that transfer the sample from to the file and, and remove it. That is all much more difficult when you're scaling it down to, to sub-microliter volumes. And what you also see is that mixing becomes much more difficult because in the big domain you have turbulence that makes uh, care of rather homogeneous solutions. But if you pipe at two solutions together on a, on a microfluidic scale, basically you, they just stack the liquids and they only mix by diffusion. So also you have to come up with a solution to deal with those kind of effects. But there's different ways to, to, to deal with these challenges, and one way to, would be to integrate all kind of active components in your disposable, like a, a mixer, a pump, a series of files, reservoirs, or fluids, but you rather quickly end up with a very complicated disposable. And yeah, this is not only adversely affecting the cost, but it also introduces a lot of failure modes, and every handling step also introduces some CV. So, um, yeah, miniaturization is probably not uh, the straightforward answer to making a microfluidics device. A more successful approach, and it's also reflected in the popularity of the test, it can be found in a lateral flow strip. This is still one of the most successful point of care immunoassay diagnostic systems. And you're probably all quite familiar with uh, uh, the way my uh, lateral flow strip works. You apply the sample on a reservoir pad reagent dissolve as it travels down the lateral flow strip. You have your incubation time. It passes over a test zone where your antibodies and your labels can bind. The liquid progresses further to a reference zone where a test strip, uh, a test line can appear and the excess liquid is uh, hold on into the reservoir. You can see here that all the steps that you find in, in the bigger leg systems are there, like the, the incubation, uh, the binding, the stringency steps, but they're integrated much more than miniaturizing all the steps uh, by adding and removing liquids. So this concept of more integration instead of miniaturization has quite some potential, although what you see in the lateral flow strips is that uh, the passive nature of this uh, integration creates quite some CV, and particularly the timing is very imprecise because it depends on the wetting properties of your strip that determines the incubation time, the exposure time to your binding site, and also the effectiveness of your stringency step. So, yeah, what we like about this kind of system is the, the integration of the, of the fluidics, but ideally one would like to have a higher control over the timing and, and, and the execution of the assay. So I think the microfluidics are a very important part of defining a, a point of care system. Ideally, we'd like to keep the microfluidics rather straightforward, but still having a, a high degree of control over your assay. The third element I want to highlight is uh, a more commercial aspect. And, and if you look at the point of care systems, you see that the menu tends to be rather small on the systems offered. And yet yeah, there's various explanation why this is the case. And one of the main reasons is uh, a technical constraint. Sometimes the platform is just not able to run all the different varieties of immunoassays, and, and hence the, the menu that's offered is, is restricted. Another very important point that is often overlooked is also the cost of uh, developing a point of care assay. I mean, if you're developing uh, an assay in a big automated lab machine, it's very easy to do design of experiments. You just load a tray, you press the button, and after an hour or so you get 96 results and you can, can start designing your next experiment. But if you're making a point of care assay, you have to design and manufacture each cartridge individually and each cartridge is individually evaluated and handled by the, by the assay developers. So it's much more labor intensive to, to develop a point of care assay. And it's just also a cost restriction that, that uh, limit the menu. So one of the, the potential solutions to, to overcome this, uh, this menu challenge is to see if a more open model could be applied. And although it's, it's not very common in uh, the in vitro diagnostics, particularly in, in the more clinical systems, uh, Luminex you find in the life science that's a more or less open platform where people can design their own essays. But if you look at the more clinical systems, you mostly see that the proprietary one company defines a platform and that's the only company that makes the essays on that specific platform. Whereas if you look at other industries, there are quite some successful examples of more open platform approaches. For example, in the IT industry where companies like, uh, like Google or Apple or Linux define an operating system and many companies make applications. They make different kind of tests uh, in the, in the analog and uh, 
for the in vitro diagnostics industry. Or it could also be the other way around, where you have Nespresso that makes the reagents, where many different companies make the machine to, to use these reagents optimally. So we try to consider, yeah, are there ways to also copy some of these more open platform models to the in vitro diagnostics industry? And I will talk a bit more detail how we uh, approach that with our Minicare platform. So after outlining some of these uh, challenges, I would now like to go in a bit more detail uh, to our, our Minicare system and explain how we try to address these challenges in, in the way we designed the system. So the system that we designed uh, is depicted uh, uh, on the left. It's a, a handheld device, or at least the dimensions are handheld, although in practice never uh, everybody holds uh, a system in his hands for five minutes while waiting for the results. So in practice you see that they typically put it on a tabletop while the assay is running. It can do quantitative detection, uh, nanomolar, picomolar range, but also sub-picomolar range for some of the more sensitive assays. And what we found also to be a very important property is that uh, to design it for finger prick samples. When you're working in a hospital, typically uh, a venous sample is available, but if you want to take these systems to more decentralized settings like uh, the physician office, uh, rapid clinics, then the threshold to obtain a sample is much lower if you can work with capillary samples because then you don't need uh, a trained nurse to do a, a venopuncture. Uh, the system is quite fast. Uh, one of the reasons the system is fast is because the, the surface volume ratio is, is very high. I will, I will show you on the next slide uh, how the system is, is designed. Uh, and also the reliability is a very important aspect. Uh, we designed the system to be CLIA waivable, and basically that means that yeah, any non-trained expert should be able to uh, work with the system and it should never uh, be able to get a wrong result. So that means you have to define very many fail-safes in the system that can detect any user errors that may affect the result, and the system should flag those and present no result. A multiplexing, I will go in a bit more detail uh, on multiplexing. We believe it's getting more and more important uh, for the future, not only to test multiple analytes at the same time, but once you can do multiplexing on your platform, you can also apply it for different purposes, and I will give some examples. Since this, this model is all based on, on, on sales of the uh, uh, reagents, it's very important to have a, a low cost disposable, so we spent quite some effort to reduce uh, the number of components, keep the fluidic simple, but also make sure that we only use passive injection molded plastic components for the disposable, and use very small amounts of reagents. To give you an impression, the, the antibody spots that we deposit in the system, they require about two nanoliters of sample each, so reagent costs are tiny, less than a cent per, per cartridge. And finally, the form factor, it, it's small enough to take it right next to the patient, and once you're done, they typically put it back on the docking station for charging, quite similar to the, the workflows that are used to in uh, the professional glucose testing. In this slide, I will show you a short animation how the system works. Uh, it's typically going to be launched in a, a emergency department, so this is also where the animation uh, plays. Once the cartridge is inserted into the Minicare system, the user only has to apply a single drop of blood. The system is very easy to use, just needing a finger prick sample. A drop of blood can also be added directly from the finger. After applying the blood to the cartridge, it will be filtered. and will automatically fill the inner reaction chamber where the individual immunoassay reagents are contained. The secret of the unique Philips Magnetech technology is based on the controlled movement of magnetic nanoparticles. The process starts by capturing only those specific molecules that relate to the antibodies on the particles. An electromagnet draws the particles to the surface where those particles that have captured a target molecule are then bound. A reversed magnetic field enables a fast and controlled separation between the bound and unbound particles. Using optical detection, the number of bound particles is quantified, enabling the analyte concentration in the sample to be determined. Lab quality test results can be seen on the reader display within minutes and can be made available to the hospital almost instantaneously. 
by means of high-speed electronic transfer into clinical decision support systems. So some of the important aspects that you can see in this system is that the microfluidics are, are very simple indeed. So once you add the sample, the sample is drawn in by capillary forces, and once the measurement chambers are filled, there's no more microfluidic action. So we have a well-defined reaction volume with a well-defined amount of reagents, and from there on, the entire assay is controlled with the magnetic forces. So simple microfluidics, this is one of the elements the second element is the, that the assay timing is controlled by the magnetic forces. So if electromagnets, and with these electromagnets, uh, the protocols that which we switch them on and off, we can control very precisely the timing of the assay. So the incubation time, the exposure time to the binding spots on the surface, but also the stringency force in, from which we use to, to separate the bound and the unbound particles. The third element that you could also see in, in the movie is that we use these magnetic particles. And, and one of the key reasons we use the magnetic particles is because, uh, because it gives you a very large surface to volume ratio. Once these particles are distributed in the reaction chamber, the average distance between the particles is less than 10 micrometer. So that means even if only diffusion is the, uh, the only rate of, of mixing or getting the reagent to your particles, with such small diffusion lengths, their system is no longer uh, diffusion limited. So by combining these elements, the simple fluidics, high degree of control, and also the fast reaction kinetics by the short diffusion distances, uh, we hope to, to meet some of the challenges uh, and, and get a, a sensitive and precise assay, uh, at the same time using a very small amount of reagents. So the entire reaction volume in one chamber is only a quarter of a microliter. And that also explains why we can work with, with finger stick samples. The detection is based on uh, an optical readout principle. Uh, total internal reflection uh, takes place at the sensor surface, and that forms an evanescent field. And this evanescent field interacts with the bound particles, and the more particles that are bound, the more of the light is lost in the interaction. So on the areas where particles are bound, you can see that uh, the sensor surface gets darker. Let's see if I... You can see here, we have the two reaction chambers over here. This is an optical reference chamber, and you can see in this specific reaction chamber, we printed four spots. You can see exactly those areas where the particles have bound. The surface gets, gets darker. The instrument reads the, the light intensity at the location of these spots, and that allows us to quantify uh, the concentration of analyte. It also explains uh, how we can do multiplexing in the system. So there's basically two different levels of multiplexing. One way to do multiplexing is that we have different measurement chambers on the cartridge, but we can also have multiple measurement spots within a single measurement chamber, and that gives a lot of flexibility. It not only gives the option to detect uh, different analytes from a same sample in a single measurement, but you can also use it for some other purposes. For example, we use it to extend the dynamic range by printing one spot with a low concentration and one with a higher concentration of antibodies, and you get one spot that's very reactive, and one spot that is less sensitive, you get two different dose response curves, and if you stitch them together, you can get a very large dynamic range up to four or five orders of magnitude. See also some other tests where precision is, uh, is very important, and in this case, we sometimes print the same spot multiple times, and then you can do some averaging over the spot, or you take the average of the two most, uh, the spots that give the most similar signals to get a more uh, precise result than you would get from a single reading. And also very important, uh, we typically reserve one spot uh, for a built-in control assay. So this is a, a, a spot that should give you a well-defined result irrespective of the analyte concentration, and that allows you to verify if the reagents in the cartridge are still active and not being damaged during transportation or storage. And of course, uh, you can also detect, detect uh, multiple analytes uh, at the same time by printing different type of antibodies in the different spots. And you could use that for triage applications or to improve the specificity to have a, a multi-marker test. Control and calibration is also a very important aspect. Uh, one of the main uh, uh, things you have to take into account is that you won't make this uh, as easy for the end user as possible. And for this reason, uh, we decided to store the master curve in the disposable itself. So once you make different lots, when you have different lots of, of uh, raw materials, there's always going to be some lot-to-lot -lot variation because of the different uh, reactivity of the antibodies. So once we make a production lot with one batch of biomaterials, 
we measure our master curve, and we store it in the RFID tag in the cartridge. So as soon as you insert the cartridge in the instrument, it has the calibration information that belongs to that specific cartridge. And it also allows you to add some additional information, for example, expiry date, to make sure that uh, you can never use an expired cartridge. And you can also use it to, to already load the appropriate test on the device so that you cannot make any configuration errors in your, in your instrument. So once we know that the cartridge has been well calibrated when it leaves the factory, yeah, then something may happen during transportation or storage, and this is why the control assay is very important that we mentioned. So if the control assay doesn't uh, give the right value, the system will discard the result and say, okay, this, this cartridge cannot be trusted. And finally, at the moment of analysis, we also have a number of built-in fail-safes. Since it's a small portable device, it may be bashed and banged around quite uh, a lot more than a typical lab instrument. So before each measurement, it will do a very quick self-test where it tests all the vital systems like the optical detection system, the temperature control system, the electromagnets. And we also do a number of tests on the sample. The system is, in principle, self-metering because once you apply the sample, the liquid will be drawn in. It will fill the reaction chambers, and once the reaction chambers are filled, there's no more flow of liquid. So if you apply more sample, then the excess will remain in the separation membrane. If there's not enough sample, the system can detect or can see that it takes a very long time before the reaction chambers are filled. So once it meets all these criteria, so once we know it's made correctly, it's not been damaged during transportation, once we know the instrument is working correctly and also that the samples are uh, behaving as normal, yeah, then we can be quite sure that when we present the result that it's a reliable result. When you come to a connectivity strategy, there's basically two different flows of data. So in the middle you see the instrument as it's used uh, by the nurse. And the most straightforward flow of data is once the test is completed, you put it on the docking station where it will communicate over POCT 1A to commercially available middleware solutions like POC Celerate or HS POC, where it will transmit the data over HL7 to the HIS or the LIS. We believe it's very important to make sure that we can uh, work with the already available middleware package in the hospital because hospitals are very unlikely to acquire new IT packages just be, to use a, another instrument. So make sure that you always adhere to the POCT 1A standard. And since we're quite big in the patient monitoring, we also store the data in such a way in the HIS and the LIS that we can pull it out and display it right next to the patient. Because otherwise, if the doctor's next to the patient, he can read it from the instrument, of course, but if he walks away and have to walk to a terminal to find the result, yeah, then you lose the point of the, the near patient test. A flow of data that's becoming more and more important is also the other way around. Uh, we offload uh, log data when a test is being completed. So that would allow, for example, the service organization to provide some remote service. Uh, you can also do some, some QC tests, but you can also see the test patterns of the different sites for example, propose a reordering of reagents when you can predict that they're running low based on the amount of reagents ordered and, and the number of tests performed. But most importantly, uh, also anonymized uh, patient data can be offloaded to the cloud where you can build uh, bigger databases and you can start running uh, clinical decision support uh, algorithms that can be put into expert systems to advise the doctor in, in making appropriate diagnosis and looking at the larger populations or uh, historical databases of outcomes. So we believe there's a lot of value in, in the data as well and that will also help to reduce uh, errors because especially in, in emergency department can be quite hectic situations. So we believe that uh, the, the data flow on the right will become more and more important in the future. Then looking at the way to get a large menu, I already mentioned it uh, before that uh, yeah, if you develop such a system, in principle, if it's a quite uh, universal uh, immunodiagnostic system, there's many applications that can be made on the system, whereas one company typically has expertise in a certain area, it could be disease area or application area. And sometimes even within a certain application area, there could be different uh, parties that have a, a deeper expertise in certain areas, for example, oncology, or cardiology, infectious disease. So what we will uh, do in commercialization of this platform is that we will develop some tests ourselves. Sometimes we do it in-house. Uh, some of the tests we also develop together with, uh, with future diagnostics, for example. 
uh, but we also open up the platform for third parties. So if there are startups with a very promising new marker, uh, but they cannot afford to develop their own platform, we open up the platform and allow them to, to put a test on the system. Or it could be large IVD companies that have a, a very deep expertise in a certain field or a broad portfolio of, of tests then we are willing to partner and allow them to put the content on it. Main driver is there also the end user perspective to be able to offer a device with a large number of tests. Uh, so we've been signing up a few companies now. One of the most recent announcements has been with uh, Johnson & Johnson, where we'll be making a, a companion diagnostic tests, but we are working on a number of other parties as well that, that will join us on the platform. So it's, it's yeah, a somewhat innovative approach, but uh, yeah, as thus far, it took a little while for, for some parties to, to appreciate this, this, uh, this kind of innovation, but we now see that after being plugging it for a while, we're gaining some traction and we're quite hopeful that we are, uh, will be able to offer a broad, uh, broad portfolio of tests uh, offered by different parties on the system. A few uh, quick results, I will not go in, in a lot of detail, but uh, I mentioned that precision is very important. I, I zoomed in on the lower end of the concentration range. In this case, it's uh, the troponin test. This is one of the first uh, tests that we will launch on the platform. In this case, we performed uh, a precision profile, uh, LOQ determination according to the EP17A2 protocol. So that means testing over multiple days with multiple devices and uh, different batches. And what you can see is that the precision comes down somewhere to the 5-6% the uh, precision, which is quite comparable, and I would say it's, it's quite good for a, a point-of-care system. We ran the protocol both on, on plasma samples as well as on a number of, of, of blood samples, and you can see that the differences in performance are very small. The main explanation for this uh, similar behavior is that in the beginning of our device we have a separation membrane so that removes all the blood cells, so that means the test is always performed in, in plasma or a very similar matrix uh, after removal of, of the cells. One of the more uh, surprising results to us was uh, when we started to do studies uh, between venous and capillary blood. We were quite uh, anxious to see whether the results we got with, with venous and capillary samples would be comparable. So we ran quite some numbers uh, in, the, in the, the cardiac departments in the hospitals. So these were results obtained by the nurses themselves, so not our lab technicians, but by the nurses. They were doing the finger pricks, and these are all uh, native patient samples. And because it's troponin, we particularly focus on the low end of the range. And here you can see uh, the blow up of that specific part of the range. And you can actually see there's a very good uh, correlation between the capillary and the venous samples. So apparently, the dynamics of this marker in the capillary samples are, are not far apart and also the arrow introduced by the sample taking of the, of the capillary samples is, uh, at least to us, it was surprisingly small. So we are very positively surprised that it could work with uh, both the capillary and the venous samples. We anticipate, of course, for troponin in the emergency department that uh, the, the venous sample will be the dominant one because as soon as the patient comes in, they typically uh, draw a venous tube for, for reference values in the lab on a number of other markers as well. But it really shows the potential to, to get good results from capillary samples, also with uh, quite sensitive assays. So we think it's very encouraging if we want to bring these tests out of the, of the hospital, for example, to the rapid clinics or the physician office labs, and maybe eventually to the home for chronic disease monitoring. This brings me more or less to the end of the presentation with a short uh, summary. So uh, when we look at the list of, of user needs, you can see that it's quite an extensive list and there's many boxes to tick before you can have a platform that can really have a good clinical utility. The main uh, requirements that we have is uh, the quality of the results, ease of use, the speed, and the IT connectivity. You can also see that making a, a microfluidic system takes a different approach. It's not just shrinking the fluidics and making everything smaller, but you really have to have a different mindset, see how the laws of physics change, and see if you can make optimal benefits of those instead of trying to battling those with very complicated structures like pumps, valves, and, and all kinds of micro mixers. And finally, I think also the commercial model uh, deserves some attention. So if you want to have a compelling solution with a broad menu, 
I think yeah, it's, it's recognized that it's hard to do it for a company on their own. So this is why we're now trying this, this semi-open model and inviting different companies uh, to, to join us and, and develop tests for this platform. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention.